joined in studio by Jim Sapika, director of the National Firearms Museum in Fairfax, Virginia, located nestled inside, if you will, the Fairfa in Fairfax in the NRA headquarters and one of the premier museums, well, let's be honest, the premier firearms museum in the country. And Jim, you brought out here to our studios another fascinating set of, of, of handguns here, revolvers, uh, the Smith & West, Wesson Schofield. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, the Smith & Wesson Schofield is a, uh, a heavy, uh, full-bore fighting revolver that was developed for the U.S. military in the 1870s. Um, it's part of the Smith & Wesson Model 3 line. Now, just like Smith & Wesson revolvers today have frame sizes that are designated by letters. For example, the N frame is the big 44 Magnum uh, size. The J frame is the little uh, uh, five shot 38 size. When Smith & Wesson started out, their models had numbered frame sizes. So a Model 3 basically means a large frame top break Smith & Wesson revolver. And uh, this was the, uh, the big gun of their product line from uh, 1870 to uh, about the turn of the century. The first uh, Model 3 that was introduced is what came to be known as the American model. And as you can see, it's a uh, large, uh, full 44 caliber, six shot, single action revolver. Uh, it was introduced in 1870, uh, three years before the Colt Single Action Army. Mm -hmm. It's what we call a top break design, which means that the, it breaks open at the top, the barrel and the cylinder tilt down, and the cartridges are automatically ejected by the ejector uh, star. It was, uh, it was really the first full-size uh, serious combat revolver that took a metallic cartridge, a tremendous evolutionary leap forward. And in uh, 1870, the U.S. military purchased 1,000 of these for a trial basis. Uh, after the Civil War, of course, the big evolutionary step was from the percussion firearms to the self-contained metallic firearms. The uh, military was looking for a full-size uh, metallic cartridge revolver, and the Smith & Wesson was certainly they, heavily in the running. Uh, they, they got it with that one. That thing would be heavy sitting on your hip, I'll tell yeah, you. Yeah, they did. Yeah. It's got the full 8-inch <laughs> barrel. I was say, it's a good-sized barrel it is. size it's there. A, it's, a good, uh, it's a good big revolver, and uh, it was remarkably successful. Very successful design. Uh, of course, everybody thinks of the wonderful Colt Single Action Army as the classic firearms of the American West. Well. Colt single action production didn't catch up with Model 3 production until well into the 20th century. So it was a tremendously successful uh, uh, handgun, both uh, domestically in the United States and internationally. Large uh, quantities were sold to f foreign militaries. And uh, some, such as this specific gun, uh, went to uh, uh, the American military at the time of the Indian Wars. This is one of those 1,000 Smith & Wesson American models that were actually purchased by the military uh, for a trial use. They were issued to troops. And uh, uh, George Schofield, uh, a military officer of the time, felt the design could be improved. He thought the latching system particularly could be improved. And as you see, the latch on this is mounted on top of the barrel. It takes two hands to open. Schofield's primary improvement was moving the latch from the barrel to the frame. And this is a Schofield Whoa. Model 3 revolver. And the latch is mounted on the frame wow. back here. The theory was that it could be operated one-handed on horseback right. with the uh, reins if, uh, in the other hand. If you're John Wayne, perhaps. If you're John Wayne, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but uh, uh, this one was uh, purchased by the U.S. military uh, in, in several different contact contracts from 1875 to 1878. Uh, it was reasonably popular. It took a cartridge related to the 45 Colt except shorter, mm -hmm. and that cartridge could be used in both the Schofield and the Single Action Army, which was issued at the same era. Yeah, real helpful there. Had interchangeable yeah. ammunition, mm -hmm. so that was very helpful. And uh, it was a very, very uh, popular military firearm. Also, it was uh, popular after it uh, left the military with uh, a number of uh, uh, lawmen and outlaws in the Old West, the big 45 caliber, uh, the speed of loading and reloading uh, compared to the uh, Colt Single Action Army where each round had to be punched out individually, right. uh, made the Model 3 design in general a very, very popular design. Uh, we have one here that is especially interesting, I think, and it's interesting because of what it is and also because of what happened to it. This is Schofield serial number one. Oh. 
It's the first Schofield revolver that was produced as a production item. Wow. Now you think that would wind up in the Smith & Wesson factory collection. You think. But this gun was issued to the U.S. military. It's got the standard U.S. markings on it uh, showing military issue. Not only that, but after military service, like so many Schofields, it was resold on the civilian market. And uh, to make it a handier size, the long barrel was getting unpopular. They, they cut, cut, cut the barrel. They nickel plated it wow. for resale. And this particular gun went to the famous Wells Fargo Company. And it has the Wells Fargo markings on the uh, uh, ejector housing lug right here. On, uh, on Schofield, Smith and or, uh, Wells Fargo used the serial number as their company number. And so right there is their company number one, in addition to being the Schofield serial number one. So it was a working, it was a working gun. It wasn't a museum piece for them. It was the first one made, but uh, uh, it was issued to the military, uh, surplused out and uh, modified and uh, went to Wells that, Fargo. I say that gun worked hard too. It, it, it had It had it two complete lives, first in service of the country and then out for Wells Fargo. Yeah, it did. Wow. But the, the, the Schofield design uh, has, has gained increased uh, public awareness. Uh, it was featured in uh, the movie The Unforgiven, the Schofield mm. kid you re may remember. It's become very popular in cowboy action wow. shooting. Uh, but that is the, that's the first Schofield that made right there. That is pretty neat, wow. Uh, tell folks where they can see more farms like these out at the National Farms Museum, how they can get out there and see it. Well, through 2009, this particular gun and a bunch of wonderful other Old West guns are on display in a special temporary exhibit called Guns West in the Ruger Gallery. Uh, these guns come from private collections all over the country, and uh, they will never be seen together again. They're mm. great uh, movie guns from the Western movies and television shows, uh, guns that were used by Jesse James and Texas Jack Omohundro and uh, sheriffs and outlaws in the Old West. It's a wonderful display. It's worth getting out there. The, uh, the museum is located at the the NRA headquarters building in Fairfax, Virginia, 11250 Waples Mill. We're open every day of the uh, every day of the year except major holidays, 9:30 to 5 uh, uh, most days, and we're open late till 7 on Saturdays. Uh, admissions always free. We get a lot of folks through, and uh, uh, we love to have people come out and see America's firearms treasures. And you guys are also in the middle of a very exciting project online as well. This, yeah, we've had a nice website for a number of years, but we are totally overhauling the website, and one of the most exciting parts of that is that we are photographing every gun that's on display in the museum, and it will be available on the website probably about five or six months out. Wow. Uh, but uh, uh, you'll be able to literally go through the museum and look at the pieces you want to online, Very and cool. it's at uh, uh, nationalfirearmsmuseum.org. Uh, and it's going to be a great resource for, for collectors and anybody who loves old right. guns. But sitting here looking at these in person, I do recommend getting out to the National Farms Museum because it's, there's nothing better than seeing these up close. Nothing, nothing like seeing the real Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. Jim, thank you very much for thank being you, here John. for another Curator's Corner, and we'll see you again next week. Cool.